All right. Uh, the computer recording is underway. Cloud recording is good. Excellent. Mr. Lugo, you can take us away. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Siting, and Dispositions. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your videos. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Riley, we are ready to begin. Good morning, I am Council Member Kevin Rowley, Chair of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Science and Dispositions. I'm joined today remotely by my colleagues, Council Member Koo, uh, Council Member Traeger, and Council Member Chin. Today we will be holding a public hearing and votes on the landmark designation of the New York Public Library, Harlem Branch, the Kim Law War Memorial, the Akwaksung Muna Hongyang Archaeological Site. We will also hold public hearing on the de designation of the Dorrance Brook Square Historical District and the proposed site selection for a new DOT facility at 101 Varick Avenue in Brooklyn. I now recognize council to explain today's hearing procedures. Thank you, Chair Riley. I am council, I, I am, I am Jeffrey Companion, counsel to this subcommittee. Members of the public who wish to testify were asked to register for today's hearing. If you registered to testify and are not yet signed in the Zoom, please sign in now and remain signed in until after you have testified. If you wish to testify and have not registered, please go to www.council.nyc.gov forward slash land use to sign up now. If you're not planning to testify on today's items, please watch the hearing on the New York City Council website. All people testifying before the subcommittee will be on mute until they are recognized to testify. Please confirm that your mic is unmuted before you begin speaking. Public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have written testimony you would like the subcommittee to consider in addition to or in lieu of appearing before the subcommittee, or if you require an accessible version of a presentation given at today's meeting, please email landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number or project name in the subject line of the email. During the hearing, council members who would like to ask questions should use the Zoom raise hand function. The raise hand button should appear at the bottom of the participant panel. I will announce council members who have questions in the order that they raise their hands. Witnesses are reminded to remain in the meeting until they are excused by the chair. Lastly, there may be extended pauses if we encounter technical problems. We ask that you please be patient as we work through these issues. Chair Riley will now continue with today's agenda. Thank you, Council. And before we begin, I, I know uh, for the sake of time, Councilmember Chin has to go to another hearing. Uh, so I just want to allow her to give her remarks uh, before she heads out. Councilmember Chin. Yes, thank you so much, Chair Riley. I have to run to City Hall for in-person housing meeting. So I really appreciate you giving me a few minutes. I just wanted to uh, voice my support uh, for the Kim Lau War Memorial and thank the Landmark Preservation Commi uh, Commission uh, for su uh, supporting this. This is a very important symbol for the Chinese American community. And it recognized the sacrifice and the contribution of Chinese American to this country in preserving our freedom and democracy. And every year, uh, the American Legion uh, post 1291 in Chinatown hosts important celebration and commemoration on July 4th, Memorial Day, Veterans Day. And that's where the community gather um, to really uh, celebrate our history there. And I am just so proud that we will landmark this site. And this is, um, it's just so important to the community. And I really urge um, my colleagues who are on the subcommittee to support this. Thank you very much, Chair Riley. Thank you, Chair Chen. I mean, <laughs> thank you, Council Member Chen. Our first item is LU 830, the, excuse me if I'm pronouncing this wrong, everyone, uh, Akwagzang Manyunyang Archaeological Site. 
This is an application was submitted by the Landmarks Preservation Commission pursuant to section 3020 of the New York City Charter and section 25-303 of the Ministry of Code of the City of New York for the designation of the Akwang Manuyang Archaeological Site located at 298-300 Sater Lee Street in Staten Island as a historical landmark. This landmark site is located in the district represented by Council Member Borelli. Kate Lemos McHale, Tim Fry, and Andre Fabry will present on behalf of the Landmark Preservation Commission for today's items. Council, please administer the affirmation. Please raise your right hands and state your names. Kate Lemos McHale. Anthony Fabry. Please unmute uh, Tim Fry. Timothy Fry. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and in answer to all council member questions? I do. I do. I do. Thank you. You may begin. Okay, great, thank you. Good morning, Chair Riley and subcommittee members. I'm Kate Lemus McHale, Director of Research at the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Thank you for the opportunity to present the Akawahung Manahanung Island Protected from the Wind Archaeological Site. It was designated June 22nd, to, uh, 2021 as an individual landmark. Um, and hopefully you have our slides. Great, could we go to the next slide, please? And as an introduction to this item and the following items, I wanted to provide some context. In January of this year, LPC uh, publicly introduced our equity framework, which has been a priority of our chair, Sarah Carroll. It was important for us to publicly reaffirm our commitment to equity in all aspects of our work, and the framework is intended to guide our priorities uh, agency-wide. This includes enhancing transparency and accessibility in our regulatory work and prioritizing designations that represent New York City's diversity um, and in areas less represented by landmarks. So these recent designations that we'll um, present today, as well as the two that you voted on last month, um, all reflect this commitment. Next slide, please. Uh, the site is associated with over 8,000 years of occupation by indigenous people and contains the region's largest known cultural complex. It is the city's first landmark specifically recognizing the many generations of indigenous peoples who lived here. Designation protects the site's below ground archeological resources. At the public hearing on May 18th, five people spoke in support of designation, including representatives of the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, the Delaware Tribe of Indians, the Professional Archaeologists of New York City, and preservation advocates. There was no testimony in opposition. And in addition, we uh, received eight letters of support. Next slide, please. The landmark site includes approximately 20 acres of highly archaeologically sensitive land located within Conference House Park in Staten Island. In 1926, Conference House Park was donated to the city of New York, and today it remains under the care of the Department of Parks and Recreation. Uh, next slide, please. The site overlooks the confluence of Arthur Kill and the mouth of the Raritan River, an important estuary that significantly shaped the area's ecosystem. Indigenous people relied upon the area's abundant resources that surrounded the site, including oysters, fish, and game. The people who lived here in the woodland period, beginning about 1,500 years ago, when a village and cultural complex were at the site, were Lenape and spoke Munsi. Uh, next slide, please. And I think, Anthony, if you can mute yourself, it would help. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, indigenous people were present 
uh, within the landmark site for over 8,000 years, and archaeology has shed light on what life was like over this long period. Over 19 archaeological projects have occurred in the vicinity of the site since the 19th century, including work by the American Museum of Natural History. These projects uncovered a series of hearths and other artifacts uh, from about 8,000 years ago, an important cultural complex used over a long period of time, and over 100 archaeological features primarily associated with the woodland area era settlement. Uh, next slide, please. And archaeological projects have found evidence of the site's use by indigenous people during the period of contact with European colonists, such as projectile points made of copper and brass, materials available through trade with Europeans. And this is a 17th century uh, depiction of Amsterdam. Um, and next slide, please. Europeans violently colonized land in Staten Island in the 17th century, and there's little archaeological evidence of an indigenous presence in the landmark site after the mid-1670s. Englishman uh, Christopher Billup received a land patent from the Crown that included the landmark site and the land on which he built Conference House, named for an unsuccessful peace conference held during the Revolutionary War. Samuel Ward um, purchased nearly 400 acres of land, and although the area known as Ward's Point was surveyed and laid out in the 1870s, it remained largely undeveloped. New streets were paved in the early 20th century, and some curbs, street lamps, and trees that line these streets are still visible in the landmark site. Uh, next, please. PC's research involved collaborative engagement with the city's federally recognized tribes, and we met several times with tribal historic preservation officers representing the Delaware Tribe of Indians, the Delaware Nation, and the Stockbridge Muncie Community Band of Mohicans. They provided meaningful input and guidance from experts in the Old Muncie language to determine a landmark name that best reflects its indigenous significance. The photo on the right was taken this spring when members of the um, tribal nations joined joined LPC and park staff to visit the landmark site. And as we discussed with council member Borelli, in our research, we noted that the name for Staten Island found in some historic colonial documents was derived from rare ten people um, and was pronounced Aquahonga Manaknong. Um, we worked with the tribes and reached out, and they reached out to what's called the Lenape um, Talking Dictionary, which is um, a group of old Muncie language specialists, to ask about the correct spelling um, and definition in Old Muncie, which is the language spoke by the Lenape. Um, they informed us that this, this um, Old Muncie name was Akawahang Manahanung, which translates to island protected from the wind. Um, and so the designation reflects this input and adds to the city's scholarship regarding appropriate and inclusive terminology for um, Staten Island and for the site. Next slide, please. LPC also worked closely with the Parts Department, and as with all individual landmarks, uh, LPC will review and regulate any proposed changes that would impact significant features of the site. In this case, we would review projects with the potential to impact archaeological resources. Designation of the Akawahung Manahanung Island protected from the wind archaeological site protects and preserves the largest and best documented known site associated with thousands of years of indigenous habitation in New York City. And it's the first uh, city landmark specifically recognizing and protecting its indigenous heritage. So the LPC recommends the city council vote to uphold this designation. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. We've just been joined uh, by Council Member Barron. Uh, Council, do we have any council members who have any questions? Any council members who have questions should please use the raise hand button now. I there see be, no council member questions. There being no more council member questions, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this item? Um, we have Simeon Bankoff registered to testify on this item. Okay. So I would like to excuse the, the panelists uh, so we can have the public testimony. Uh, thank you so much, LPC.
Thank you. Good morning, council members. Uh, my name is Simeon Bankoff. I'm the executive director of the Historic Districts Council. <coughs> Excuse me. HGC is the statewide advocate for New York's historic neighborhoods. We are he thrilled to be here uh, to testify in favor of this archaeological landmark. This is one of the. This is only the second um, archaeological site that is being designated by the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Uh, archaeology is a very pivotal part of the, uh, but ignored. Uh, part of the LPC's role within the city of New York. Uh, this specific site is uh, remarkable in that it is the first one to be, as uh, as Kate Lemos Hale said, it is the first individual New York City landmark uh, to be specifically designated for its importance to the indigenous peoples and the pre-European peoples of New York. Um, we are thrilled again, and we strongly support this. Uh, we would also like to state that uh, we are in favor of the LPC's equity framework and also continuing its archaeological work, uh, we would recommend, in fact, uh, a another site is in Elmhurst, Queens, uh, where is a small plot of land known as the African Burial Ground at 4711 90th Street, which has survived three centuries as a touchstone of one of the earliest freed African-American communities in the region, founded one year after emancipation in 1828. Uh, newly freed African Americans established a congregation there, the United African Society, later known as the African Methodist Episcopal Church, on the side of the burial ground. There are over 300 bodies of um, in, uh, emancipated African Americans who are still buried in that site. I know that the Landmarks Commission is working with uh, the developer to uh, try to commemorate that site, and we would recommend also strongly that it be landmarked. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simeon. Council, is there any more members of the public who wish to testify on LU 830? Are there any members, of the, if there are any members of the public who wish to testify, please raise your hands now. There are no other members of the public registered to testify on this item. Seeing no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item, the public hearing on LU 830 is now closed. Our next item is LU 829, the Landmark Preservation Commission designation of the New York Public Library Harlem Branch as a historic landmark. The landmark site is located at 9 West 124th Street in Manhattan Council District represented by Council Member Perkins. Tim Fry and Andre Fabri will present this item. I remind you that you are still under oath and you may begin whenever you are ready. Uh, good morning, Chair Riley and subcommittee members. I'm Timothy Fry, the Director of Special Projects and Strategic Planning at the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Um, I believe you have our presentation. Um, if I could get that up on the screen. Great, thank you. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to present the New York Public Library Harlem Branch designated on June 15, 2021 as an individual landmark. Uh, next slide, please. The New York Public Library Harlem Branch is one of 67 circulating libraries constructed with funding from industrialist Andrew Carnegie in the early 20th century, the city's three library systems, and is one of 12 Carnegie branches designed by the prominent firm of McKinn, Mead, and White. In addition to its architectural significance, the library has provided civic and cultural resources and programming to the neighborhood for over 100 years. At the public hearing on April 20th, 2021, and in written testimony, the commission received support for their proposed designation from 10 people, including representatives of the New York Public Library, and there was no testimony in opposition. Next slide, please. As seen here on the map, the library is located on West 124th Street in South Central Harlem across from Marcus Garvey Park and near the designated Mount Morris Park Historic District and Extension. Next slide. Mm -hmm. 
1909, the Harlem branch of the New York Public Library opened at 9 West 124th Street. The Harlem branch reflects the history of the 20th century of 20th century Harlem and its changing demographics. When first opened, much of the area was inhabited by European immigrants, and by the mid-1930s, the Harlem branch began to serve the growing African-American and Afro-Caribbean communities in the neighborhood. Next slide. As a civic space, the library helped foster black cultural life in Harlem. In the late 1930s, it played a role in the black community theater movement supported by the w, a WPA program that constructed professionally equipped theaters in the Harlem branch and other area libraries, and also briefly served as the home of the Rose McCundin Players and Workshop Theater. This group sought to provide performance opportunities to, for African-American playwrights and actors including the actor, director, activist, Aussie Davis. In the early 1940s, the Harlem branch also served as the temporary home of the renowned Schomburg Collection during its uh, enlargement of its facility on 135th Street. Next slide. The Harlem branch is one of five Carnegie libraries in Harlem, each designed by the Candide and White. Getting on the left of this slide is the 135th Street branch, which is part of the Schomburg Center for, the, for Research in Black Culture. Next, the 150, 125th Street branch, the Harry Belafonte 105th Street, 115th Street branch, and finally, the Hamilton branch, all of which are New York City designated landmarks. Next slide, please. Today, the Harlem branch continues to serve the needs of community residents, providing access to library resources and a range of programs. Under the careful stewardship of the New York Public Library, the classically influenced building with limestone facade has changed little over time, and more recent work included sensitive alterations to the exterior, such as the replacement of the entrance door and windows to reflect the original design. Next slide. And this committee, this concludes my presentation and the Lammers Preservation Commission recommends this the council vote to uphold this designation. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I don't have any questions. Uh, council, are there any council members with any questions? Are there any council members with questions? Again, please use the raise hand button now. I see no council member questions. Thank you, council. There being no more council member questions, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this item? Simeon Bankoff and Valerie Bradley are registered to testify on this item. Okay, before the public testify, I would like to excuse the LPC panel. Thank you, Tim, and thank you, Anthony. Simeon? Starting. Starting time. Good morning, uh, <clears throat> Council Members. Simeon Bankoff, Executive Director of the Historic Districts Council, HDC, is an enormous fan of libraries, and we're always thrilled to see when the city acknowledges their importance by designating them. Uh, there are only 67 existing uh, remaining uh, library buildings from the initial Carnegie grant um, scattered in all five boroughs, and we recommend actually that all of them be considered for landmark designation. Most recently, the Historic Districts Council has uh, successfully sponsored all of their inclusion um, uh, to the National Register of Historic Places in the hopes that that might be able to bring some additional monies to their restoration and their maintenance. Um, this is a fantastic library. It is one of the only five in Harlem that has not been designated. Uh, Mr. Fry spoke well of its importance to the to the Harlem community. And so we strongly support this designation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Simeon. Uh, Council, you said there was another public testimony? Uh, yes, Valerie Bradley. Starting time. Ms. Uh, Valerie Bradley, please accept yeah, the- you go, Ms. Bradley. Am I in now? Yes, you're in, Ms. Bradley. Go ahead. Okay. 
Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Valerie Jo Bradley, and I'm president of Safe Harlem Now, a membership not-for-profit advocacy organization dedicated to protecting, preserving, and celebrating Harlem's irreplaceable built heritage. Safe Harlem Now is delighted uh, to submit uh, this testimony. Uh, the Harlem community has five branches of the New York Public Library. Each one was designed by the firm of McKim, Mead, and White. They opened in the Harlem community between 1904 and 1909. Four of, uh, of the firm uh, of the libraries have been designated New York City landmarks, and we are looking forward to celebrating the designation of the fifth one, the Harlem Branch Library. The New York Public Library is the nation's largest public library system, and it has been an essential provider of free books, information, ideas, and education since 1895. The Harlem branch of the New York Public Library cited on West 124th Street, across the street from our beloved Marcus Garvey Park, and adjacent to the Mount Mars Park Historic District, and extension is at the heart of a vibrant and historic Harlem neighborhood. Classical revival in style, built of limestone, the five McKim, Mead, and White designs are similar in appearance, but each has its own personality and unique features. The Harlem branch has been serving the community since its opening in 1909 shifting from a largely white population in the early 1900s to a community of immigrants from Scandinavia and Eastern Europe. I'm after, fine. What? You could continue, Ms. Bradley, go okay. ahead. After World War I to an African-American community beginning in the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s and continuing for the next century, it has a storied history as a civic center for the burgeoning African-American community. In addition, the groundbreaking Rose McClendon Players Theater Group based in the library nurtured African-American actors during this time. In addition to traditional library services, the Harlem branch has been a focus of educational innovation and service providing exhibition space, performance space, a liter literacy center, and vocational training. It is a vital community hub that provides far more than just access to free books and materials. More than a century later, the Harlem branch continues Andrew Carnegie's vision of libraries as temples of learning, ambition, and aspiration for towns and cities throughout the United States. Save Harlem now urges you to vote for the designation of the Harlem Branch Library. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Bradley and Mr. Bankoff. Any other members of the public who wish to testify on LU829, the New York Public Library Harlem Branch Landmark designation, should make themselves known now by pressing the raise hand button on Zoom. This meeting will briefly stand on ease until so. Seeing all the members of the public who wish to testify on this item, the public hearing on LU829 is now closed. Our next item is LU831, the Landmark Preservation Commission designation of the Kim Law War Memorial as a historic landmark. The landmark site is located at Kim Law Square in Ch Chat Chatham Square in the Manhattan Council District represented by Council Member Chin. Kate Lemos McHale and Andre Fabri will also present this item. I remind you both that you are still under oath and you may begin whenever you are ready. Thank you, Chair Riley um, and subcommittee members. I'm grateful for the opportunity to present the Kim Lau War Memorial in Manhattan designated on June 22nd as an individual landmark. And if our slides are available, we could go to the second slide, please.
Thank you. Designated by Poi Gum Lee and dedicated in 1962, the Kim Lao War Memorial is a granite ceremonial gateway located in Chinatown's Kim Lao Square. The arch, sponsored by the American Legion, is named after Second Lieutenant Benjamin Ralph Kim Lao and honors Chinese American soldiers who died while serving in the United States military. Its design combines traditional Chinese architectural forms with a streamlined modern aesthetic, and it has served as an important community monument for nearly 60 years. At its public hearing on June 1st, 12 people testified in favor of the proposed designation, including representatives of the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, City Council Member Margaret Chin, the Lieutenant B.R. Kim Lao Chinese Memorial Post 1291 of the American Legion, preservation organizations and individuals, including the niece of Lieutenant Kim Lao. No one spoke in opposition. In addition, the commission received 51 uh, written submissions supporting the proposed designation, including from the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association and several veterans organizations. Next slide, please. The Kim Lao War Memorial is located within Kim Lao Square in Chatham Square, um, indicated by the star on this map. It was identified as part of a broader study of Chinatown as an important public monument and symbol of Chinese American contributions to US history. Chinatown has a fascinating layered history. While there are several designated landmarks in the area, the Kim Lao War Memorial is the first New York City landmark that specifically recognizes Chinese American history and culture. Next slide, please. Early immigration from China to the United States was mostly related to railroad construction in the West. The completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869, coupled with an outbreak of anti-Chinese violence, prompted many immigrants to relocate to New York City uh, in the vicinity of Chatham Square. And by the 1880s, Chinese shops faced the square. The growth of Chinatown slowed after the discriminatory 1882 Exclusion Act restricted Chinese immigration to the United States. But the community built complex organizations and its restaurants were attractions by the turn of the century. Despite being denied full citizenship and facing extensive racial discrimination, approximately 20,000 Chinese Americans enlisted and fought for the United States during World War II. The Chinese Exclusion Act was repealed in 1943, but it was not until 1965 that immigration from Asia opened widely. Next slide, please. Chatham Square was an important uh, junction of the second and third avenue elevated train lines by the late 19th century and was cast in perpetual shadow until 1955 when the elevated tracks were replaced by the subway. Could we go to the next slide, please? Thanks. In 1961, a small crescent of land was laid out in Chatham Square as a public place named Kim Lao Square after Second Lieutenant Benjamin, Benjamin Ralph Kim Lao. Uh, next slide, please. Benjamin Kim Lao graduated from the Pennsylvania Military College with honors in 1942 the only Chinese American in his class. Despite widespread discrimination against Asian Americans, Kim Lao served as a lieutenant, second lieutenant in the U.S. Army Field Artillery Branch and then became a pilot. He died while attacking Chinese military installations in the South Pacific in World War II at the age of 26. Dedicated in 1962, the memorial was a gift of the Lieutenant B.R. Kim Lao Chinese Memorial Post 1291 of the American Legion, the largest American Legion post in New York City. The dedication of the monument drew large crowds and was of great significance to the Chinese American community and in particular veterans. Uh, next slide, please. The memorial was designed by the Chinese American architect Poi Gum Lee. Born on Mott Street in 1900, he was educated at Pratt, MIT, and Columbia. He worked in Shanghai in the 1930s and became prominent there before returning to New York. He served as supervising architect for the New York City Housing Authority and had his own practice in Chinatown. Um, Lee's work has been cited by scholars as among the most important Chinese American architect of its time. Um, the Kim Lao War Memorial was a, is a simplified version of a Pai Lao or Pai Fang, and I 
I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, um, a traditional gateway in Chinese architecture that evolved from Buddhist forms in India. Traditionally, they were decorative gateways into villages or ceremonies, and contemporary examples are often erected as memorials or as gateways into Chinatowns throughout the world. Uh, next slide, please. The memorial consists of a granite ceremonial gateway flanked by benches. Its design blends traditional Chinese architectural forms like the peaked roof and brackets with a streamlined aesthetic. Inscribed at the top of the arch in both Chinese and English are the words, in memory of the Americans of Chinese ancestry who lost their lives in defense of freedom and democracy. The monument's details echo vernacular Chinese forms in a striking modern expression. Next slide, please. In the 1990s, the park was expanded and designed, and the street grid was reconfigured to address some dangerous pedestrian conditions. In 2001, the park department's first historical signage in Chinese was installed at the arch. The landmark site is a lot in part, and if we could go to the next slide for that, um, it consists just of the footprint of the memorial gateway and the adjacent benches, so you can see that there. Um, and the last slide, please. The memorial sits at the epicenter of Chinatown as a site of honor for Chinese American veterans. It serves as an important place of pride, gathering and remembrance of the sacrifices of the Chinese American community for a country that has not always fully accepted them or acknowledged their contributions. It's significant as well for its design by the architect Poi Ji Lee and rec LPC recommends the city council votes to uphold this designation. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. I just have one quick question, Kate. Um, I saw the barriers sure. around the memorial. Is there any way to uh, get any more attractive uh, type of barriers uh, around the memorial? That is a good question. The Parks Department is doing a conditions assessment and is planning um, restoration work. I think the barriers are, are, you know, to keep the public safe, but that is okay. something we could talk with them about. Thank you. Sure. Uh, council, are there any uh, council members who have any questions? Again, any council members who have questions should please use the raise hand button. I see no council member questions. There being no council member questions, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this item? Simeon Bankoff is registered to testify on this item. Thank you. I would just like to excuse the LPC panel uh, before we allow the public to testify. Simeon, you may begin. Time starts now. Council members, Simeon Bankoff, Executive Director of the Historic Districts Council. HDC has long been interested in the designation of cultural sites and the designation of more landmarks in Lower Manhattan. We've tried to shine a light on this neglected significant sites in Chinatown through multiple classes of our Six to Celebrate program. So we're particularly pleased that the LPC is honoring this prominent public site by Chinatown's first native born architect with this designation. The history of Chinese immigrants and Americans of Chinese origin in America um, is a rich, complex and sadly overlooked one. For a population that's been part of our city for so long, there's little in the public record and less in the public consciousness which acknowledge and honor the contribution of this varied and diverse community. We welcome uh, the LPC's ongoing efforts to address this absence and hopes that this designation is with the first of many which engage and protect sites of community significance. There are many worthy sites, including buildings within Chinatown highlighted in the Landmarks Commission's survey, such as the Merchants Association building designed by the same architect, Mr. Lee, at 8385 Mott Street, which are so important to New York City's rich history, but whose private owners might be less inclined to preservation than the city's parks department. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simeon. Any other members of the public who wish to testify on LU831, the landmark designation of the Kim Law War Memorial, should make themselves known now by pressing the raise hand button on Zoom. The meeting will briefly stand at ease. Seeing no other members of the public who wish to testify on, the, on this item, the public hearing on LU831 is now closed. We will now vote to approve LU830, the landmark designation of the Akuwang Manuhong Archaeologic Site LU829, the landmark designation of the New York Public Library Harlem Branch, 
and the LU-831, the landmark designation <clears throat> of the Kim Law War Memorial. Council, please call the roll. <clears throat> Riley. Yes. Ku. Aye. Baron. Aye. I vote, I vote aye on all. By a vote, is that everybody here? Traeger. Uh, Traeger. Aye. By a vote of four in the affirmative with zero in the negative and with zero abstentions, the items are recommended for approval. Uh, the vote will be held open for Council Member Miller. Thank you, Council. We will now continue to the next of LPC's applications before us today, LU828 and the designation of the Dorrance Brooks Square Historic District which includes approximately 325 <clears throat> buildings in two sections of Frederick Douglass Boulevard in Council Member Perkins District in Manhattan. Kate Lemos McCall and Andre Fabri from the Landmarks Preservation <clears throat> Commission will present this item as well. I remind you that you are still on the oath. You may begin when you're ready. Thank you, Chair Riley. Um, thanks for the opportunity to present the designation of the Dorrance Brook Square Historic District in Harlem, designated June 15th, 2021. And if we could have our slides, please, we could go to the second slide. Thank you. The historic district features intact streetscapes that exhibit a striking variety of architectural styles and buildings designed by prominent New York City architects. The residential enclave is significant for its association with notable African American figures during the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, next slide, please. The historic district includes two sections shown here in red between St. Nicholas Park and Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Boulevard. The eastern section abuts the southern boundary of the St. Nicholas Historic District known as Strivers Row, which was designated in 1967. And this district was the um, is an exciting intersection between agency priorities under Chair Carroll's leadership and Community Board 10 preservation priorities for Harlem. LPC has worked closely with CB10, recently designating the Mount Morris Park Historic District Extension and the Central Par Harlem West 130th to 132nd Street Historic District. The Dorrance Brook Square District corresponds with two more of their priority areas. We received a request from the Dorrance Brooks Property Owners and Residents Association uh, to evaluate the eastern section. And through the staff's careful research and analysis, we identified these two areas. They're separated by recent construction along Frederick Douglass Boulevard, but they're linked historically, architecturally, and by their combined cultural significance. We did extensive outreach with property owners. We held three informational meetings um, in Zoom and several follow-up meetings um, and correspondence with individual property owners. At the public hearing on April 20th, 12 people spoke in favor of the proposed district, including uh, representatives of Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, the Dorrance Brooks Property Owners and Residents Association, several preservation organizations, including Save Harlem Now and the Historic Districts Council, and individuals. One property owner asked that his property be removed from the boundary. Um, the commission also received five additional letters of support and letters from two additional property owners asking to be removed from the district. Next slide, please. Prompted by the arrival of elevated rail service along 8th Avenue, speculative row house development in the historic district began in 1887 and continued rapidly until the early 20th century. Apartment buildings were constructed in the 1920s, completing the residential development of the area. Uh, next slide, please. The result of this rapid development of long rows of houses in similar design is the remarkable cohesiveness and notable architectural character of the streetscapes. Next slide, please. The district is anchored by Dorrance Brook Square, named for the black serviceman who died in action while serving with a segregated 
military in the First World War. Dorrance Brooks was widely regarded as a hero and renowned for his bravery and service to our country. His actions helped to dismantle racist notions about Black Americans' fitness for military service. The square was dedicated in 1925 and was the first public space in New York City to honor an African American in this way. Um, and this district is, is the first historic district named after an African American. President Harry Truman applauded this um, and was later honored at Dorrance Brook Square after having desegregated the US Armed Forces. Next slide, please. African Americans who had been pushed by discrimination and demolition out of neighborhoods on the west side of Manhattan began moving to Harlem in the early 20th century. This also corresponded with the Great Migration with many more African Americans moving to New York City. Um, during the Harlem Renaissance, the historic district's row houses, apartment buildings, and churches, which remain remarkably intact today, housed many notable people and organizations who made important contributions to the arts and literature, social justice and political activism, healthcare and medicine, and education, among other facets of society. Next slide, please. The historic district was the home of prominent individuals who made influential contributions to the arts and literature during the Harlem Renaissance, including SAS W.E.B. Du Bois, stage and motion picture uh, actress Ethel Waters, and celebrated sculptor Augusta Savage, and artist studios here included the Harlem Artist Guild and the Uptown Art Laboratory. In their home at 580 St. Nicholas Avenue, Regina Anderson, Luella Tucker, and Ethel Ray Nance fostered the careers of notable Harlem Renaissance artists like County Cullen and Langston Hughes, among many others. Uh, next slide, please. Several buildings in the historic district were sites of important social activism work. These include the homes of W.E.B. Du Bois, Walter F. White, and Dabney Montgomery. The New York Urban League, founded to improve urban conditions for African Americans in New York. The White Rose Mission, a settlement house for African American women and girls. And the headquarters of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, the first African American trade union. Next slide, please. Discriminatory barriers denied African-American doctors the same rights, privileges, and access as their white counterparts. Important hospitals started by African-American doctors to serve the Harlem community are located within the historic district, the Vincent Sanatorium and Hospital, and the Edgecombe Sanatorium. And several prominent med medical professionals also lived and worked in the district, opening offices there where they were not able to elsewhere. Uh, next slide, please. Notable educators advanced understanding of African history to inform the work of African-American artists and writers during the Harlem Renaissance. Charles Seifert, who created the Ethiopian School of Research History, and Dr. John Henrik Clark, a significant author, educator, historian, and pioneer of the Pan-African Studies, lived on West 137th Street and their homes served as public archives. Next slide, please. Religious institutions established in the historic district during the Harlem Renaissance have been important centers of the community. Some of the significant uh, religious buildings in the district include St. Mark's United Methodist Church north of Dorrance Brook Square, the Beulah Wesleyan Methodist Church on West 136th Street, Grace Congregational Church on West 139th Street, and the Mount Calvary uh, United Methodist Church on Edgecombe Avenue. And next slide, please. This map shows the location of uh, these historically and culturally significant institutions, organizations, and individuals. In addition to its notable cultural significance, the, hor the historic district is characterized by remarkably cohesive streetscapes resulting from its rapid development in the 20th century. It's predominantly characterized by row houses with some institutional buildings and mixed use buildings. Um, uh, those are mostly along the avenues. Uh, next slide, please. And the historic district shows a remarkable degree of architectural integrity with limited alterations and very intact streetscapes. And the last slide, please. 
with its highly intact streetscapes of late 19th century and early 20th century architecture and rich associations with the Harlem Renaissance and civil rights movements, the historic district is an important reminder of both the early development of the neighborhood as well as the contributions of the African-American community to the history of New York and the nation. As we celebrate the 100 year anniversary of the Harlem Renaissance, it's particularly important and appropriate time to recognize and celebrate the significant cultural and social history of this district, along with its intact and meritorious architecture. LPC recommends the city council votes to uphold this historic district designation. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> yep. If any council members have any questions, please use the raise hand icon. There being no council member questions, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this item? Uh, yes, Chair, there are. There's Simeon Bankoff, Valerie Bradley, Keith Taylor, Leslie Bright, and Kakuna Karina. Okay. I would just like to excuse the LPC panel before we have the public testify. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Anthony, and thank you, Tim. Okay. So we will begin with Simeon. Simeon, go ahead. Starting time. Simeon Bankoff, Historic District's Council, HTC, has long been interested in extending landmark protections to neighborhoods in Upper Manhattan and has consulted with Community Board 10 over a decade ago when they were formulating their preservation plan. We're pleased that the plan has achieved some success in seeding the ground for preservation efforts in the area, and we're immensely pleased that the Landmarks Commission took this, uh, took this role to designate this historic district. Uh, this historic district has many parents. Um, several longtime preservation advocates and more recently involved community activists and residents have been instrumental in bringing this effort forward successfully. It would not have happened without the efforts of Michael Adams, Angel Ayon, Valerie Joe Bradley, Ewan Chin, the Dorrance Brook Square Property Owners and Residents Association, Save Harlem Now, Keith Taylor, and the West Harlem Community Organization, to list but some of the key players alphabetically. Special thanks also to Marissa Marvelli for drafting the nomination, the successful nomination to the National Register. Um, this area is both architecturally remarkable and redolent with history. Uh, it was mentioned that it is the first historic district named after uh, an African-American New Yorker. And despite their presence in the city since its inception, there are few places in New York City named for black New Yorkers, and even less of those have had names for almost a century. The area attracted a diverse population over the decades with a number of standout historic personalities who cha helped change our, pers our country, few more so than Shirley Chisholm. The first black woman elected to Congress, Brooklyn-based Chisholm became involved in childhood education in this neighborhood, working in educational programs at Mount Calvary United Methodist Church at 116 Edgecombe Avenue. This was the beginning of her career in children's education, a career which eventually propelled her to serve in Congress and run for president, which was another first. Uh, we applaud the Landmarks Commission for including 116 Edgecombe Avenue within the boundaries of the historic district. We understand that there are extenuating circumstances for the intended demolition hanging over the site, but we feel strongly those permits do not I'm negate inspired. the site's historic significance. We also hope that a solution could be discovered which will save this beautiful structure and find solace that LPC will be at least able to guide whatever development replaces the church into a form that complements the surrounding neighborhood. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Simeon. Ms. Bradley, you could go next. Starting time. Ms. Bradley, you have to unmute, Ms. Bradley. Valerie Bradley with Save Harlem Now. Save Harlem now wholeheartedly supports the designation of the Dorrance Brook Square Historic District. We celebrated in June 15, 2021, when the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission voted unanimously to designate an intact district. And we are looking forward to participating in an even bigger celebration when the New York City Council approves the designation of an important historic district in Harlem. 
the West Harlem Community Preservation Organization and the Dorrance Brooks Property Owners and Residents Association are to be commended for their efforts to produce a request for evaluation that made the case for the Dorrance Brooks Square to be designated. A stellar example of late 19th century architecture with its richly detailed road houses and majestic churches, this neighborhood stands out not only for its preserved built environment, but also for its historical importance. Closely associated with the Harlem Renaissance and as a gathering place for African-American civil rights advocacy, Dorrance Brooks will be the first historic district named in honor of an African-American, a black soldier who died in action while serving in a segregated military regiment during World War I. The Dorrance Brooks Square became the site of frequent protests against discriminatory practices in the military, labor, and housing. It was also home to prominent Harlem Renaissance figures, including W.E.B. Du Bois, author, Walter White, civil rights leader, Jules Bledsoe, performer, and will be the first historic district name, I mean, and uh, Alilia Walker, all of whom hosted or participated in salons or intimate gatherings attended by nationally known names. Time is fired. Dr. May Edward Chin, the first African-American female doctor in Harlem, lived and practiced at 44 Edgecombe Avenue. Shirley Chisholm, the first African-American woman elected to Congress, started her career as a teacher at Mount Calvary United Methodist Church. And Augusta Savage, an artist and sculptor, started an influential community-based arts program in a garage at 321 West 136th Street. Before closing, I would like to note that our council person, Bill Perkins, stands with the Harlem community in support of the designation of an intact district. He sent a letter to that effect to our speaker, Corey Johnson. Thank you for allowing us to weigh in on the designation of this important community. Thank you, Ms. Bradley. Mr. Taylor, you could go next. Starting time. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Riley and members of this committee. My name is Keith Taylor. I'm the president of Dorrance Brooks Property Owners and Residents Association. I come before you this morning to ask that you approve this proposed Dorrance Brooks Square Historic District, the first in New York City's history to be named after an African-American Harlem health fighter, private first class Dorrance Brooks. In the proposed district is the Dorrance Brooks Square, which was dedicated in 1925 as the first public park in New York City to be named after an African-American, private first class Dorrance Brooks. He was a Patriot World War I soldier who lost his life fighting for America and France, despite the bitter reality of Jim Crow segregation back home. A decade ago, the local community board recognized the dangers of development destroying the architectural and cultural history of Central Harlem and created its historic preservation plan recommending nine historic areas worthy of landmarking. Two of those historic study areas would be landmarked by this proposal. Our block association with assistance from local historic advocacy organizations, such as Save Harlem Now, Historic Districts Council, West Harlem Community Preservation Organization, as well as strong community support has been able to get state and federal historic designation for some of the proposed districts. But your approval is most significant by far. As Frederick Douglass stated, Paris concedes nothing without demand, it never did, and it never will. Find out what any people will quietly submit to, and you will find out the exact measure, exact measure of injustice and wrong which can and will be imposed upon them. For the Harlem African-American community, which has lost so much for so long, what little historical legacy remains deserves special consideration to preserve and cherish. Examples include the plan to demolish the historic Mount Calvary United Methodist Church and two connected brownstones, as well as the destruction of the Harlem Renaissance artist Augusta Savage's art studio, despite local community board resolutions advocating for their preservation. There is no question about the proposed district's architectural, cultural or historic value to Harlem and the greater New York City community. It was only through strong neighborhood support that this block association was able to apply for state, federal and city historic designation. And we now ask that you approve this important landmarking designation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Ms. Karina, you may go next. Starting time. Good morning. Um, uh, members of the City Council and representatives of the Landmark Preservation Commission. 
Uh, my name is Katrina Karina. I'm a resident of the Darns Brook Square Historic District and a member of the Darns Brooks Property Owners and Residents Association. Um, my focus is on how uh, our association organized because it's our goal that ultimately we'll be able to support other uh, community organizations that, are, uh, that seek to, uh, re uh, to obtain a, a similar type of recognition uh, for their community members. Um, we, re we use technology, old fashioned community organizing techniques to amplify our community's voices and receive information from and communicate to the greater public to solicit their support. Um, while we did use our uh, website as the primary vehicle for that, um, we, um, we really serve to inform our community about Doris Brooks first, his, his significance to our cities and Harlem's history. And then we also informed residents about ongoing community preservation initiatives and the highlights and best practices learned from those organizations efforts. While we did build our electronic presence during the process of securing state and federal historic district status, and ultimately the landmarking process that we're discussing today, we also um, uh, ensured that our, our residents were able to participate in association meetings, town halls, uh, presentations by city, state, and nonprofit representatives uh, about the process, ultimate out outcomes, and the future impact of landmarking on the community. Early in the process, we discovered that apart from the input of peer organizations and individuals with specialized knowledge about community preservation, there was no roadmap for us to follow. The association committed to using our experiences to create a blueprint for other organizations seeking to obtain similar recognition for the hidden figures from their communities. We ensured that every, at every step of the process, we placed documents, information about the process, contact information for city, state, and federal agencies, and links to institutions that support pre uh, preservation efforts on the Doris I'm Brooks inspired. Property Owners and Residents Association website. We hope that um, with, through our experience, we'll be able to support other underrepresented, uh, underrepresented communities to succeed in their preservation efforts, the importance of which has been highlighted in today's meeting on the fir first city landmark protecting an indigenous site and the first landmark historic district named for an African-American citizen. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this hearing, and I hope that you will vote to approve this application. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Karina. Uh, next is Mr. Michael Henry Adams. Starting time. Hello? Yes, we can hear you, Ms. Adams. Uh, Go ahead. Good morning, Chair Powell. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Michael Henry Adams. I wrote the book, Harlem Lost and Found. Uh, the fatal flaw of the Preservation Commission's um, inclusionary uh, um, initiative is a matter of resources and time. When Greenwich Village was proposed as a series of little tiny historic districts which were disconnected, the community said no, because um, these districts don't represent the breadth and the comprehensive area which represents the heritage of this area. Well, in Harlem, we our heritage has been proposed to be protected by little tiny discrete historic districts um, like this one. And, and only now is that being done in a serious way. And the reality is, is that the commission are penalizing us for their failure to act in the past, which has led to all kinds of buildings being um, uh, diminished and uh, undermined in the meantime. And so when we first were looking at trying to designate Dorrance Brooks Square as an historic district, uh, all of our churches were still churches and were still um, uh, uh, had viable congregations. And subsequently, they all have been tempted by real estate developers who want to um, demolish our churches and replace them with luxury condos for white people. And this is occurring all over Harlem. Since um, in the past uh, 10 years, we have lost 20 historic Harlem churches. This too little too late operation really must be changed and there has to be a different way in which we have more comprehensive designation. And in designating Dorrance Brooks, the city council will take up its responsibility to assure 
that we at least are starting to acknowledge that there is as much at stake and worth preserving in Harlem as there is in Greenwich Village, and that it shouldn't be that two thirds of Greenwich Village is protected by landmarking, where only 10% of Harlem is. Um, thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Adams. I believe we have one more public testimony. Uh, Ms. Bright, you could go ahead. Starting time. Ms. Bright, you're muted. Ms. Bright, you're still muted. We, we, we can't really hear you, Ms. Bright. You're unmuted now. And not working. No, it's not working. Um, can we give uh, Ms. Bright a phone number that she can call in on? Or if Ms. Bright has written testimony, she could indicate that with a nod and we could try to get that. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes, we can hear you. OK, good morning. Sorry for the, um, the technical. Um, appreciate this opportunity to, to speak and um, to address the committee. I, my name is Leslie Bright, and I am a resident of the proposed designated area. And I'm also a member of the Dorrance Brooks Property Owners and Renters Association. And I'd simply like to take this opportunity to underscore and represent, you have the history of, of, the, of the community and the proposal. But what I'd like to do is simply underscore and uh, the actual involvement of other members of the community and other residents by sharing with you just a little bit of information. In addition to the, uh, the support provided by the advocacy groups, of course, the West Harlem Community Preservation Association, Save Harlem Now, and the Historic District Council um, in aiding us in getting these the state and national designations and propelling us forward for this um, for the city designation. I'd like to underscore the other the community's involvement and to simply note that as a part of the effort to finance the the study and the the supporting requirements for the, to actually get the um, the plans in place and to formulate the proposals that we actually did outreach to the community and received. Um, you know, by in a series of letters and educating through the association, reaching out to members within the designated community and held a number of informational sessions and hosted workshops. And as a result of that, an outreach in April of 2018, we received responses within 90 days, with, excuse me, within 60 days from 33 households contributing $2,500 to support the effort in engaging the architect and other um, people for infrastructure and media support. So I just wanted to ask the, um, a, a common and a broader interest from the individual residents. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brighton. You were breaking up at the end, so I don't know if you still want to submit your testimony uh, so we can have it for the record. Okay. Sure. Any other any other members of the public who wish to testify on LU828, the designation of the Doris Brooks Square Historic District, should make themselves known by pressing the raise hand button on Zoom. This meeting will be briefly stand at ease until you do so. Seeing no other members of the public who was to testify on this item, the public hearing on LU-828 is now closed and the item is laid over. I now open today's public hearing on our last item, LU-835-101 Varick Avenue. This item is an application submitted by the Department of Transportation and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services pursuant to section 197C 
of the New York City Charter for the site selection and acquisition of a property located at 101 Barrick Avenue in Brooklyn for use as a DOT operation and warehouse facility. The site is located in the district represented by Council Member Reynoso and Council Member Reynoso couldn't be here today. So I will be reading his remarks. He says, good morning uh, to the to Chair Riley and members of the committee. My name is Council Member Reynoso and I represent the 34th district in which this action is being proposed. I want to thank the committee and DOT for their work to get us to this point. As I have noted to DOT previously, I believe the proposed use is appropriate for the site, which is located within the North Brooklyn IBZ. However, as the city continues to rezone manufacturing sites for non-industrial uses, I do not believe it is prudent for the city to, con to continue leasing industrial sites. If DOT is a certain that this site is necessary for its infrastructure needs, we should be purchasing it outright, rather than leaving ourselves subject to the whims of a de developer and risking the loss of space deemed essential for city functions. I encourage the mayor and the council to conduct a long-term assessment of the city's needs for industrial space and the identity, the policy, and to identify, excuse me, the policies necessary to ensure the preservation of the city's core industrial districts for city facilities and other essential infrastructure. We know that updated industrial zoning is part of any such solution, and I continue to advocate for the creation of a core industrial district. But we should also be identifying and purchasing sites for the long term rather than site by site as each agency needs arises. Having said that, I do believe this action is critical to supporting DOT's mission. I support the application and I urge the members of this committee to do so as well. Thank you and thank you so much for your remarks, Council Member Reynoso. Presented for the administration, we have Dorit Blakesley, Jessica Warwog, Rebecca Zach, and Daniel Zuckerberg, excuse me, Zuckerman from the Department of Transportation and Nina, Nina Coder and Laura Ringleham for the, from the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. Excuse me if I chopped up any of your names. I now ask that these witnesses be unmuted and the council administer the affirmation. Please raise your right hands and state your names. Dorit Blakesley. Nina Carter. In the order that you were called, let's say it that way. We have to hear the names. Dorit Blakesley. Jessica Warwark. Daniel Zuckerman. Nina Carter. Laura Ringelheim. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? I do. Yes. I do. Yeah. Thank you. You may begin your presentation when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, can you pull up the present? Okay, great. Perfect. Um, so hello, my name is Dora Blakesley and I work for DOT Facilities Management. I'll be presenting about 101 Varick Avenue. Next slide, please. Here's a picture of the project site, 101 Varick, outlined in red. DOT, in collaboration with DCAS, is seeking to site select and acquire this privately owned site. The site lot is approximately 141,000 square feet. The site is located in an M31 zoning district in the North Brooklyn Industrial Business Zone. And the DOT units that are proposed to be located here include part of the sidewalk inspection and management, abbreviated as SIM, citywide concrete unit, and the traffic operations streetlight storage warehouse, as well as office space. Currently, the streetlight warehouse is operating out of 101 Varick under a license agreement. Next slide. Thank you. 
DOT needs a new space at 1-1 Varick due to two city priorities. SIM is expanding due to a court mandate that requires 162,000 curb ramps to be installed or updated throughout the city, and 25 new SIM employees would be assigned to 101 Varick. And the traffic operations streetlight warehouse needed to move from 37th Avenue to provide access for DEP to finish constructing water tunnel number three. And this operation is supported by six DOT traffic operations staff. Next slide. One One Varick has been identified by DOT as a very good location for many different reasons. Oh, can you go back to the last slide? Sorry, you skipped the, can you go to, pre okay, there you go. <laughs> uh, the site is well served by public transit. Also, the, um, there is access to Metropolitan Flushing Avenues as well as the BQA. The existing building and site is adequately sized for DOT and would require minimal changes. The site is located in an M31 zoning district and the occupancy of this building with new employment would foster economic activity in the area. Next slide, please. This slide shows the proposed site plan for 101 Varick. As already stated, SIM and Streetlight Warehouse will be located here. Please note that SIM will not be storing concrete materials or be preparing concrete on site, and no new construction on the site is proposed. Next slide. As for resiliency, critical infrastructure would be protected from any potential flooding events. And sustainability is also very important to DOT and is a priority for the city. So DOT in partnership with DCAS will be exploring the opportunity to install rooftop agriculture, solar panels, or a green roof. And we have started discussing these options with the building ownership. Next slide, please. A fair share analysis was performed for this site. And it was determined that there is not a disproportionate concentration of similar city facilities in the study area. Next slide. This project also underwent a city environmental quality review, and it was determined that the project would not create any significant adverse impacts related to hazardous materials or contamination, vehicle trips, or parking. And a negative declaration was issued on April 1st, 2021. Next slide. So in summary, DOT is seeking to site select and acquire the property at 101 Varick Avenue to house an expanded SIM citywide concrete unit and relocated street lighting warehouse. The project site is ideal for DOT for many reasons. It's located close to public transportation. It has excellent vehicle access to the city's highway system. It has both industrial and office space that is adequately sized. It's appropriately zoned for DOT operations. It requires minimal improvements and it would increase economic activity for local businesses. A fair share analysis determined that there is no disproportionate concentration of similar city or DOT facilities in the area. And a seeker EAS determined that the project would not create significant traffic, parking or environmental impacts. Um, so that's the end of the presentation. If there are any questions, uh, we can take them. Thank you so much, Dora. Thank you. I don't have any questions. I don't see any council members who have any questions. Um, council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this item? There are no members of the public registered to testify on this item. Seeing no members of the public who wish to testify on this item, the public hearing on LU835 is now closed and the item is laid over. Thank you. Council, are we still leaving it open for Council Member Miller to vote? Uh, he has not shown up, so we can close that vote. Okay. The vote stands at uh, four in the affirmative, zero in the negative, with zero abstentions uh, for the items to be approved and recommended to the full land use committee. 
Thank you, Council. That concludes today's business. I remind you that if you have written testimony on today's items, you may submit it to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that is land use testimony at council NYC, uh, excuse me, at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number or the project name in the subject heading. I would like to thank the applicants, members of the public, my colleagues, subcommittee council, land use staff, and the Sergeant of the Arms for participating in today's hearing. This meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you, everyone.